we started? Now we are. Great. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so nice to see you today, wherever you are in your day. Uh, very much looking forward to this conversation between David Sloan Wilson and Sandra Waddock. Um, I think uh, there's a lot we're all very curious about and also ready to be provoked around. Um, so the International Humanistic Management Association welcomes you all. And with that, I will turn it right over to Sandra. Do look in the chat for just some details around how the process works. A reminder to please do keep your um, audio muted and we will moderate chat um, Q&A through the chat. Yeah, so welcome everyone. And thank you, Erica and Michael. And behind the scenes work on this and welcome David. Um, I'm really pleased to be introducing David Sloan Wilson um, today. Um, David is the SUNY Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University and president of an initiative called Pro-Social World, which I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about in his talk, which is a nonprofit organization whose purpose is to consciously evolve a world that works for all, which I think many people on this call can um, identify with. Um, his books include This View of Life, Completing the Darwin Darwinian Revolution, and Pro-Social, Using Evolution to Build Productive, Equitable, and Collaborative Groups. Um, he wrote that with Paul Atkins and Stephen Hayes. Um, and I highly recommend that book if you haven't read it, um, because it really, it really provides uh, insight into what it means to be human, I think, in in new ways. So, David, welcome. Um, and I know you're going to make about a 20-minute presentation, 20, 25-minute presentation. Then you and I will have some conversation and share a couple questions. And then we will turn to um, questions from other participants that get asked in chat. And I will ask people um, to unmute themselves and um, and ask their own question, if assuming they're still here when that happens. So, David, let me just turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much. A real privilege to be talking to this uh, uh, to this group. And um, again, I feel like I'm not a stranger at this point, at least with some of you. Uh, uh, we're going back quite quite a long way now, so that's uh, that's exciting. And I'll actually end on that uh, on that theme. Okay, so here's the uh, dictionary definition of uh, evolution, the gradual development of something, especially from a simple to a more complex form. And this word was used far before Darwin uh, in its general form. And what Darwin did was he provided a, um, let's see, here we go. Um, a very specific meaning of, of uh, evolution, uh, specifically based on three facts and their, and their outcomes. So Darwin, Darwinian evolution, the meaning that he attached to the term was focused on these three facts, variation, organisms vary in almost everything that could be measured about them, selection, their differences make a difference, replication, organisms tend to resemble their parents, and this amazing outcome that uh, given these three facts, then uh, the properties of organisms change over time, adapting them to their environments. And so this is also a simple in retrospect that uh, had moved Thomas Huxley to say how stupid of me not to have thought of uh, that. And it was, the, it was the, this specific meaning of evolution that was so significant. And that uh, by the um, mid 20th century, could enable somebody like Theodore Sistov Dansky to say nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. There was something so simple about the, this theory that it could explain um, a world. And this might seem a little bit abstract, but I was uh, I kind of lived the dream, you might say. I was a graduate student in 1973. I was unaware of Dobjansky's paper at the time, but this was my lived experience that I went to graduate school expecting to be an aquatic ecologist to spend my days studying zooplankton and other creatures of the water. But what I was being taught was a 
kind of a conceptual toolkit that could be applied to anything, any organism, any topic. And I feel this is like the best kept secret in academia that evolution provides a passport to the study of all uh, topics and something which has established itself, has proven itself, at least within biology. I'm not alone. I think most evolutionary biologists sometimes during their career pick a new topic and a new organism and off they go because they have this amazingly general conceptual toolkit. And yet, despite this, we can also say that the modern synthesis was also the great constriction because it was focused almost exclusively on, on genetic evolution, as if the only way that offspring can resemble their parents is by sharing the same genes. And this is, I think, almost unintentionally conveyed by this mosaic tile here. I think this is a from a science building at Notre Dame University. And our, around the, around the um, circle, we have Dobjansky's famous quote, but what does the circle include? A DNA helix. And so around the world, and for expert and novice alike, when one person says the word evolution, most people hear the word genes. And so this leaves out um, other evolutionary processes. What's happened since then, since roughly beginning in the 1970s is what we call generalized Darwinism. And that refers to any process that combines the triad of variation, selection, and replication. Genetics, of course. Um, also epigenetics, changes in gene expression rather than gene frequency. Forms of social learning found in many species. And then forms of symbolic thought that are distinctly be human. And most recently, AI, artificial intelligence, which equally could be called artificial evolution because that's what it is. It's evolution in warp drive. Um, evolution can be an intragenerational process in addition to an intergenerational process. So the adaptive comp uh, component of the immune system is one um, example. And our behavioral flexibility, what B.F. Skinner called selection by consequences is, um, is another. So what we have today I think very recently is a theory that's already proven itself within the biological sciences is, is in a position to prove itself for all human related topics. That's what's uh, on um, offer. And a big part of um, generalized Darwinism is called dual inheritance theory. Let me walk through this just quickly. Uh, two streams of inheritance in our species. So uh, every one of you is a collection of genes. We call that your genotype. Uh, those genes influence just about everything that could be measured about you. We call that your phenotype. Each one of you is also a collection of symbols, a meaning system, a worldview. And those symbols, let's call it a symbotype to stress the comparison, also influences just about everything that could be measured in you, your very same uh, uh, phenotype. And thinking of our meaning systems as the cultural equivalent of our genes, I think, has tremendous metaphorical transfer and provides a novel perspective on topics such as therapy, training, education, and uh, spirituality. And what we can say, just as with our genotypes, um, both our genotypes and our symbotypes um, provide a, a degree of flexibility. We all have a repertoire of behaviors in responding to our environment. But if you wanna go beyond that repertoire, you need to change either your genotype or your symbotype. And your symbotype, of course, is a lot easier to change within your, um, within your lifetime. And so this speaks to the need at all levels, not just the individual level, but uh, all levels for inner work in addition to outer work. If we're gonna substantially change the way we act, then we must substantially change the way we think and feel the ideas that we carry in our, uh, in our uh, heads. And so, so here's some elementary take home uh, messages. Hold on just a minute, let me just shrink this down here. Um, what we can say in a very elementary fashion is that we do not perceive the world as it is. We perceive the world in ways that help us to survive and reproduce in the world. We don't expect our genes to directly correspond to the environment. We expect our genes to result in behaviors that are enacted in our environment. And the same is true of our meaning uh, systems. 
So, um, and our genetically evolved organs of perception, such as vision here, what we can see is in the bottom panel, well, on the top panel, we see what's actually out there in the world, a spectrum of wavelengths. And then in the bottom panel, we can see the world as we see it based on a tiny uh, fraction of the light spectrum, which we perceive as discrete colors, when in fact, it's just a continuum of wavelengths. And then that's because this artificial world of our vision helps us to survive and reproduce in the world. Um, and I think it's both insightful and humbling to think that the same is true of our culturally evolved meaning systems is like our genetically evolved uh, five senses, full of adaptive fictions. And so you, we can ask the question, you know, is it Oh, this is a, a delay here. Sorry about this. Let me just, uh, quite a long delay. Is it possible to see the world as it uh, really is? And I think this, this graphic here for vision says that Yes, it is. I mean, the bottom panel is the world that we see, but the top panel is the world that we know exists thanks to scientific um, inquiry. So it is possible to perceive the world that's actually out there. It does require a social process, uh, the norms and institutions of scholarship, science, responsible journalism, judicial procedures. Um, and we learned from anthropologists that all cultures have a factual reasoning mode in addition to an adaptive fiction mode. And as I was uh, looking, pulling together this image uh, for this talk, I began to realize just how informative it is because it demonstrates, first of all, our bias perception, the bottom panel. Secondly, our ability to overcome it, that's the top panel. And third, the immense practical benefits of doing so. Because if you look at those, these, um, wavelengths, thanks to the full spectrum, we have such things as radar, FM, TV, shortwave AM, x-rays. And so after knowing more about the world as it really is, then we can begin to utilize it. Uh, so the immense practical benefits for, uh, uh, for um, uh, doing so. Okay, so that's generalized Darwinism and it takes place against an intellectual background, especially for, for business, and management. And part of that intellectual background is the neoclassical economical um, uh, paradigm, which has such a dominant influence in economics, business, and management. Uh, this is sometimes called economics imperialism. Here's a quote from an article called Economics is Universal Science. It's formal mode of argument, mathematical apparatus, fair language, and rigorous logic have made it the model for the softer social sciences. And whatever else you might think about the neoclassical paradigm, it does qualify as an interlocking set of ideas worthy of the term um, uh, paradigm. Now, if you could somehow remove the influence of neoclassical economics, then what would you be uh, left with? And, um, and what would you'd be left with is what Dennis Snower and I call diffuse pluralism. Many islands of thought and practice with little communication among islands, and therefore undeserving of the term paradigm. Paradigm implies an interlocking set of ideas, and that's what's lacking, I think, in most of those so-called softer uh, social sciences, including the management uh, profession. And so uh, I have a map here of the Malay archipelago, which is where the other um, discoverer of natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace, where he did his work, and biologically, the Malay archipelago is so diverse because these islands are isolated from each other. Each one kind of goes its own separate way as far as their genetic evolution is concerned. And we can think of both academia and also the many um, um, islands of practice in the, uh, in the uh, uh, same way. And uh, so here, we have, for instance, the word theory, and especially in the humanities and social sciences, and I think also in, in management, it means like any perspective. We expect there to be many, many theories, 
and not necessarily to be able to relate them to uh, uh, to each other. So I think it's against that background that if we look at uh, humanistic management, we can see on, on the one hand, it's um, you know it's a it's a great perspective. It's widespread. We have a whole international association, but it's still just one island in the archipelago of the management profession. And Sandra, I think that uh, when we met uh, for the first time at the June conference in Fordham, you said something to that effect in terms of your standing in the management uh, profession. You might probably regard yourself as a renegade or 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 uh, something like that, but uh, definitely in some sense an island in a larger uh, a larger um, archipelago. And this is a huge problem. I think we really have to think hard about about not only going beyond neoclassical economics, but also going beyond diffuse um, uh, pluralism. And that's where I think generalized Darwinism uh, comes in as something which qualifies as an alternative paradigm. And so from this perspective, we could make some very bold claims. We can say that all organizations need the same core design principles to be both well-governed and adaptable. These are two things that all groups need. We can also say that the evidence for this claim is hiding in plain sight what we know what to look for. There's abundant evidence once we actually are able to see it with the help of the new paradigm. We can say that the generalized Darwinism uh, paradigm is broadly affirmative of humanistic management, philosophy, theory, and practice, a good match, which is great because that means that what's been pushed to the periphery of the management profession by the neoclassical paradigm can now become central to it, uh, to the new uh, uh, paradigm. So one added value of the uh, uh, generalized Darwinism is to provide a paradigmatic foundation for human management as opposed to being uh, 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 merely one island. And another added value is an improved ability to accomplish positive change in real world settings over and beyond what we're currently able to do, which is considerable um, by, the, uh, by the way. Okay, so in, the, in our working of this, what, uh, we, what I've been doing with many others with ProSocial is first of all, once again, the two common denominators, what all groups need is governance and adaptability. Uh, the first, um, is, uh, can be thought of as a generalized version of polycentric governance developed by Ostrom et al. So Eleanor Ostrom, a generalization of her work provides a kind of a pillar for governance. And the work of Stephen C. Hayes and uh, more generally contextual behavioral science provides the pillar for adaptive adaptability. This is how we are developing the, uh, uh, the um, generalized Darwinism a paradigm. And I think that a lot of you, maybe not all of you, are familiar with the core design principles of uh, Eleanor Ostrom, which uh, we think can be applied in this wording to any kind of, uh, of group. And so you can imagine a group that has a strong sense of identity and purpose uh, with an equitable distribution of benefits and costs. Um, and basically, what we can say is that the first core design principle defines the group and endows it with meaning. The core design principles two through six coordinate activities within the group and protect against the disruptive self-serving behaviors, the all important problem of, um, of um, cheating and other rewriting and other disruptive uh, behaviors. And that the seventh and eighth principles apply the, um, uh, apply the same principles to relations between groups. So these principles are scale independent. They're, they're needed for between group interactions no less than within groups uh, interactions. So that's a tremendous uh, simplification. And so these are the uh, core design principles for governance that all groups uh, need. Now that's an empirical hypothesis. This is a testable hypothesis. And uh, the evidence that we're accumulating with many others include a survey research, of course, a review of the CDPs and the management literature, um, Ostrom is little known in the management literature, but it's easy enough to search the literature for the eight core design principles. And when you do, as my colleague Paul Atkins has done, 
you find just overwhelming evidence, positive evidence for the core design principles in, uh, in the management uh, literature. There are beautiful case reports of businesses that have converged upon the CDPs, including the conscious capitalism movement and the, and the B Corp movement. Uh, there's real world impl implementations, which of course is the best proof if you actually help groups implement the core design principles and then demonstrate an increase in their performance. And there's also a research program that's been taking place at Fordham with Michael and his colleagues in which uh, pro-social training has been embedded in the undergraduate uh, curriculum and treating it as a kind of a research laboratory. And Michael, I hope you can um, say something about that in the uh, in the uh, in the Q and A. So here's a survey we did now five years ago, which very simply asked participants to provide information on two groups that they knew well. Think of two groups that you know well. Uh, let one be a workplace group, and and the other be any other group of your choice. Provide information on how well the groups implement the core design principles and how well they function as groups with respect to trust, satisfaction, needs, cooperation, and commitment. And what this survey shows is, in the first place, a strong correlation between the implementation of the CDPs and performance outcomes for all kinds of groups, workplace groups, no less than other kinds of groups, and also that on average, workplace groups were deficient in all eight CDPs. There's something about workplace groups that's deficient in all eight CDPs, isn't that amazing? With the largest deficits being in local autonomy. In other words, many people in their work can't do their jobs as they see fit. Sense of identity and purpose, many people don't find much meaning in their work groups. And decision-making, many people are just are influenced by decisions that they do not have any, any, any hand in, in um, and making. So how, why is it that, that this category of groups, business groups, is on average uh, deficient in all eight core design principles? And I think that comes back to dual inheritance theory, basically. How you act, how you see the world, and how you act depends very much on what's inside your head. So if Eleanor Ostrom is inside your head, you're going to see the world in one way. And if Milton Friedman is inside your head, you're going to see it another way, which orients perspective, provides a toolkit of sort, but not a toolkit that actually leads to good, uh, uh, good uh, uh, outcomes. And not only is this true for economics and business, but because economics, the influence of neoclassical economics has been so pervasive um, across the board, then this same individual level competitive mentality is just um, um, everywhere. Uh, and especially in education, I think, it's especially tragic to me to think that uh, that without knowing it, this is harming our own children. And sometimes in the most elite schools are the most bent on this kind of individual level competition and creating the most uh, anxiety. Also, it influences us as, as, uh, as uh, teachers in universities, that you know, the whole promotion scheme in education is forcing us to behave in ways to advance uh, that is um, that is uh, toxic to uh, to um, groups functioning groups functioning uh, uh, well. Now, despite the fact that there's an average deficit in business groups, of course, groups vary as well. And on the top end of that distribution, the, the groups that are highest performing, then we find. Um, we find amazing examples of groups that, for, in the first place, they perform well, and then now it's an empirical question: Do they perform well because they have implemented the core design uh, principles and for uh, governance and adaptability? And the work that we've done on that is, uh, I think, a resounding a yes. Uh, this is a, a company that, in this audience, is known to many of you. I'll bet it's not known to all of you. And whenever I give talks, I ask, have any of you guys heard of Barry Waymiller? And nobody has, despite the fact that a beautiful book has been written on it by Raj Sisodia with uh, CEO Bob uh, Chapman. But it is an amazing example of a business that works well. That's great. But what's amazing, even more amazing about this company is that it has 
acquired, but it doesn't use that word. It uses the word adopt over 140 other companies and transform their cultures as well, uh, typically without hiring, without firing uh, anybody. It's a culture change. It's not a personnel change. And so this is a replicated experiment in pro-social cultural evolution, replicated over 140 times. It's famous within a certain circle, but it needs to be famous um, on a much broader scale. And I think we're in a position to do that. I've done two podcasts, one with Raj and Bob, and, uh, and the other with some of the senior management um, at uh, Barry Way Miller. And they're both just amazing uh, 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 podcasts in which we first just tell the story. And then we, uh, we, we look at the good fit between the practices that uh, Barry Way Miller has converged upon and the core design principles for governance and adaptability. And in the uh, uh, podcast, Bob Chapman says more than once, he says, you know, I bring business leaders to see what we're doing. And they always say, Bob, I've never seen anything like it. And my response to that is, well, if you haven't seen anything like it, it's not because it's not out there. Actually, it's all over the place out there if you know what to look for. So you have to thank your perspective, not the actually existence of the best uh, um, uh, best practices. This requires unlearning just about everything that you've learned in business school in order to uh, converge upon these, uh, these um, uh, principles. And so now in terms of the, the methods that we've developed at ProSocial for actually working with groups to improve their governance and adaptability, what we can see here is in the first place, multiple levels uh, individual small groups and the multi-group organizations operating in a, a cultural ecosystem. And in each case, it's a variation selection and replication process. Basically, flexibility, adaptability is a managed process of cultural evolution. We form goals that are take us in our value directions. We try stuff out and then we notice what works and then we repeat that again and again and again in multiple contexts and multiple scales. And in two of our case studies that have been assessed exceptionally well, this is work of Robert Stiles on two Australian government agencies. Uh, what in the first place, there was a, a huge impact uh, as a result of the intervention, which is um, in the top graph here, the positive gains for the agency that uh, Robert worked with compared to all other agencies in Australia. The reason this case study is so good is because the Australian government gives an annual survey to all of its agencies so we could make this comparison, not only when we did the implementation, when Robert did the implementation, but for the years following. And so what the lower graph shows is not only was there a positive gain as a result of the facilitation, but the, the uh, agencies continued to improve year after year afterwards. So they've been truly been made more adaptable and they were now improving on their own without further the need for further uh, facilitation. And we have a nice article uh, writing this uh, uh, writing this um, um, up. Okay, so here's the common sense that emerges from the new paradigm. This is what we're in, um, able to see. Uh, first of all, the systemic good must be the explicit target of selection in a globalized world. That's the global systemic good. Lower level units and identities, such as nations, religions, just everything that's below the global level, whatever you identify with, these remain important. This is the starting point of cultural evolution, uh, but they must be coordinated with the higher level common good in mind. Small and appropriately structured groups emerge as fundamental units of social organizations. This affirms the work of people like Robert Putnam and, of course, Eleanor Ostrom that uh, in some respects, the, the, the smallest unit is not the individual, certainly not homo economicus. It's the individual functioning in the context of small, meaningful and appropriately structured groups. And so this, we need to rebuild as Robert Putnam has been tirelessly saying throughout his career, this fabric, this kind of cellular fabric of, of social life. Governance and change must be participatory at all levels. If you look at those core design principles, you'll see that they're inherently equitable, democratic, 
and participatory, which is a wonderful conclusion to be able to draw. And we must function in two capacities. First is designers of whole systems in which we have the welfare of the whole system in mind. That is the opposite of the invisible hand. But then we could also function in the part, in, at, as participants in the systems that we design. And as in that role, then oh, we do not need to have the whole system in mind. And so there actually is a legitimate conception of the invisible hand metaphor that emerges. For example, think of a traffic system of a city. If it's gonna be a efficient traffic system, we have to design it with the whole system in mind. But once we've designed it, then individual drivers can just follow their local uh, decisions about where to go. And they do not have to have the whole system in mind. That, that uh, concept can be and needs to be very much uh, uh, generalized. Okay, so then um, I'm now nearly at the end of my talk. So, uh, and uh, so um, I love the idea of catalysis uh, in chemistry, rates of reaction can be vastly accelerated as we see here. Look up elephant toothpaste if you want to uh, uh, know more. And uh, the same is true of cultural rates of reaction. And so I think what this is all about is working together to uh, catalyze positive cultural evolution. Another thing Bob Chapman said, which I would now like to repeat, is that cooperation can spread faster than COVID. Cultural evolution is already going very fast, typically in a direction that we don't want. And so, but knowing uh, uh, knowledge about cultural evolution can cause positive cultural change to be just as fast as negative cultural change. Cooperation can spread faster than COVID's. And then finally, as I was pulling this talk together, I was reminded that this is not like an introductory talk. We've been having this conversation and making considerable progress for years now, and with one milestone being the June conference that uh, Michael and company helped organize where I met Sandra. That was a great milestone. And so some of the projects that are already ongoing is uh, uh, evolutionary case reports, uh, which uh, invites participation uh, with Raj Sisodia. Uh, we're organizing a graduate seminar that we're calling from Friedman to Darwin, which will be taught at Tech Monterey in the spring, but we want to teach it in a way that could also be taught at other locations. And so there's another opportunity. Michael's doing awesome work on, on uh, business school education and doing good uh, uh, research for, on it in addition to improving the uh, curriculum. Um, and then of course, working with business corporations in a, in a way that results in continuous improvement. I think we're pioneering a relationship that could be had with businesses that is uh, something that we could all be engaged in. And so with that, I hope I've kept a time and I'm hoping a lot will come through in the Q and A. So Sandra, I pass to you and then uh, look forward to a, a great uh, uh, discussion. Great, thank you so much, David. I have one, one. I'll ask one question. Then there are several that um, that are in the chat, and I'll ask people. Um, you can raise your hand if you don't want to pose your question in the chat, or you can put your question in the chat, and we'll try to get to you. Um, so, um, so my question is: You talked about neoliberal econ or neoclassical economics, and then you talked about uh, uh, your your um, sort of general principles and uh, and a possible. So the neoclassical economics is, is a big story that we tell ourselves, and it's become incredibly embedded. And I just, uh, first of all, why did it? Why has it become such a successful story in terms of? getting into our heads and what is it going to take for us to switch that story to more of this kind of story that you've just been telling us? So I think that when you um, uh, look at, trace the neoclassical economics down through history, you find that it, you know, it begins very early all the way back to the, uh, to the uh, 1800s. And this has been said many times. Um, there was the part of the enlightenment and the scientific revolution was to that we wanted to base you know all things human on the natural sciences we, you know we had newton and his laws of motions and it was just science was proving itself so spectacularly in the in the uh, natural physical and natural sciences that that uh, economists and other social sciences what they wanted was a physics of social behavior 
a physics of social behavior was what they wanted. And then in order to do that, that forced so many assumptions upon them, basically the assumptions that we associate with neoclassical economics, that, um, that um, that's what, um, that's what um, um, emerged. And, um, and I think um, what was needed to replace it, I think I'm maybe repeating myself, is an alternative uh, a paradigm. Diffuse pluralism won't do it, a thousand critiques um, just do not uh, uh, do not cohere, and so I think that by having an alternative model, and also realizing that we don't have to get there from here, we don't have to take you know baby steps modifying neoclassical economics in order to get to something different. It's the whole nature of a new paradigm that we just start with a new paradigm, and then we prove its worth. And so I think ultimately the ultimate proof of a paradigm is the actions that it that it motivates. So the more that we can demonstrate that the new paradigm results in cooperative groups at all scales, um, then I think the more it will gain traction and, um, and, um, and uh, as well it should. Great. Um, yeah, I, 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 I talk about that as blessed unrest. And um, in my book on catalyzing transformation, I talk about three. I, I said I was only going to ask one question, but I think I'm going to ask a second one. Um, uh, so I talk about three stories. One is scientism, which is the belief that only science matters, which you are kind of alluding to there, but not fully. And the other is human exceptionalism or human separation from nature, um, which which are deeply both deeply embedded in what you said, I think, and. Um, so I guess the the second question is how 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 I, I if we put out a story it has to be as compelling as the neoclassical one in order to get people um, to adopt it quickly and we need to do that quickly so I mean I what would you I mean I know this is part of your strategy but what other strategies would you recommend to all of us who are all academics here and working in this same domain. Well, when you mention scientism and, and human exceptionalism, I think in some ways, <clears throat> at least what I was able to present in this short space, I would be vulnerable to that criticism. But of course, I am, did give a very scientific account, and there is some sense in which um, we can say that the, the, the human capacity for symbolic thought, uh, although cultural traditions exist in many species, um, the human capacity for symbolic thought is exceptional. Uh, so at the same time, I think that what's typically associated with scientific and uh, scientism and human exceptionalism is not at all what um, um, a problem with this paradigm. And what it ends up appreciating is cultural diversity for sure. And cultures um, as they actually operate are the suffuse with spirituality, the arts, ritual, uh, and so on. And if we want our cultures to work well, then uh, they have to have all of these, all of these, uh, all of these elements. And uh, and for example, we can richly appreciate indigenous wisdom, um, as long with all other enduring cultural forms, as 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 cultural life forms that are that uh, command our highest respect for being survivors, basically, and they're very difficult environment so uh, so uh, so that's a longer a longer conversation Sandra uh, I want I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit on what we discussed briefly at the June conference in which you kind of portrayed yourself as an outlier despite the fact that you're very well known and and well read and so on but uh, but you still described yourself as a as a outlier and I just wondered if you could elaborate on that to, to illustrate my point, if you agree with it, about the management profession being a big archipelago, and and um... yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, generally, I don't publish anymore in the top tier journals um, because most of the work that I'm doing is not really of uh, interest to people in the management discipline, and so I've always sort of viewed myself as um, standing on the edge of stuff and on the outside looking in in a way. And so I've written about people I call difference makers and these, and the, the whole, this series comes out of a book on intellectual shamans. Um, and um, yeah, 
but I, I want to turn, Marty's got his hand up and we have a couple, we have several questions in the chat. So I'd like to, and Michael's got his hand up too. So let me take Marty's question and then I was going to go to Michael anyway, because he had a question in the chat. So I'll go to him next. Hi, Marty. Marty. Uh, thanks, Sandra. <clears throat> Well, you know, I've been attending uh, these Zoom meetings now for quite a few years, and I'm not teaching in university anymore, and I'm not publishing in academic journals, but I'm very, had been very involved in <clears throat> organizational development, and but now I'm a humanist chaplain in a university working with students, and David, you know, one of the things that's on the mind of my students all the time they come in, and that is the fact that they are incredibly worried about where the world is headed in terms of its ecology and the uh, climate change, so much so they don't even know if they want to even trust any of the governments and any of the institutions. So a prof came to me and recommended this book, and I'd like you to tell me what you think about this approach, because he doesn't mention you in the book, and I was hoping he would. It's called Blessed Unrest, and it's by uh, a journalist and environmentalist. Oh, James likes this one. Good. By Paul Hawken. And he uses the metaphor out of evolution of life, which is it all started at very small molecules and made its way all the way up through cells and organisms and replication until we get to human consciousness, which is stardust that can think, which is, uh, you know, in cosmos. So the idea is he doesn't trust any top-down forms of intervention. He thinks that they're split. He thinks that they are not only just neoclassical economics, but they war with them themselves for the short run. They don't have a long-term view at all. And that the evolutionary model that he puts out there, which is millions of little tiny small groups of students, of indigenous people, of little small pockets within countries that you wouldn't think have any concern for climate change. They are the ones that are going to make the difference. And we need to support the million small cells of ecological responsibility. Are you familiar with Mr. Hawkins? What do you think of that approach? Well, you know, this just goes to show you that uh, that um, um, this is such a, uh, I sometimes compare this to like the photographs of the universe where you see all these galaxies. Each galaxy is a dense collection of stars and then there's the enormous space between the galaxies. So here we have all the time I'm encountering people that I should know about and they should know about me, but we don't because we're in separate um, separate galaxies. So I'm I'm sad to say I don't know about this gentleman. I think he, um, I, I will, I, and I see some of the others do. Um, I think he sounds a lot like Teilhard de Chardin, um, <laughs> and I know a lot about him. And so I think that uh, one way to summarize all of this is that uh, this is very Teilhardian, and uh, and Teilhard can be updated. I mean, Teilhard uh, um, uh, really um, uh, withstood the test of time. But I'll make one other point quickly about this bottom up uh, 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 point that you were raising, that this is gonna happen you know, from the bottom up. And I would amend that slightly and then say that what's needed is a combination of bottom up, or what we call bottom up and enlightened top down. Because bottom up really only goes so far. And what you really need are capacitating organizations. It might be business or government or philanthropy or, or actually the regenerative um, finance models that are capable not of command and control, right. not centralized planning, but functioning as coordinators of the bottom-up uh, uh, process. So I think bottom-up meets enlightened top-down. That's what we need to work towards. And uh, if there's any opportunity to do that in business or anywhere on earth, in any context, then that is what I think we're we're looking for a combination of bottom up meets enlightened top down. Yeah, I would I would add to that the whole notion of catalyzing transformation takes Hawkins observation, which I interpret a little differently as saying, look, there are all these small scale initiatives that aren't connected. 
um, and says, if we want these to become effective in making the transformation that we need, we need to find some ways of bringing them together and cohering exactly. them. Exactly, exactly. Just think of it in terms of selection, variation, and replication. First, we need a common goal. Then we need to find out what's out there. Yeah. And if there's not that kind of communication, and for that, we need a common language. Right. If we come from different islands, and then we, we it's the Tower of Babel, basically. And so exactly. what, what, what the evolution is doing is providing a common a common language, and then we have to select yeah. and replicate. Put it this way, if the three ingredients are variation, selection, and replication, we need to be highly intentional about all three of them. And if we're not, then they'll still take place to a degree, but not at the scope that these do. So we can think of this as building a worldwide cultural inheritance system in which variation, selection, and replication are all as intentional as we can possibly make them. Right. So seamen uh, always uh, need a navigator, huh? Michael? Yeah. Yeah, well, well, thank you, David, and thank you, Sandra. Uh, I think I want to go back to something that you were asking, Sandra, before in terms of why was the neoliberal one so effective? And uh, I, I want to press David a little bit on the core design principle, or what, what you're presenting right now as a new paradigm, isn't that sort of like a process theory, a universal process orientation? Whereas I think the neoliberals were very clear about the building blocks of what human nature is. And I know that has been very delegitimized over the time, but isn't there a, that mustn't there be an alternative to assumptions of homo economicus and what would they be? And uh, the other thing in terms of evolution, as you said, is value free, can go anywhere. But I think in the end, you're sort of implying a teleology a la Teilhard. And I just wanted you to comment on that. Where and how do you see that uh, emerge and visible in nature? I think, Michael, you can come back at me if I'm if I'm not understanding your, your points correctly. But um, some more to say about the, the neoclassical paradigm. First of all, it's ahistorical. It treats human nature as fixed and atomistic, of course. And historically, it has always been used to justify the status quo, because what it seems to imply is that basically the current distribution of wealth is fair. And so historically, it always, has always been a paradigm that has been used to support the status quo. An evolutionary paradigm is historical, for sure. And it implies that what's, what we have in the present, our present institutions are not the same in the past and need not be the same in the future. And so in general, that has been more of a heterodox um, um, uh, view. And I think it, it is very much a process uh, um, orientation. A point I wanted to make earlier is that, um, oh gosh, I don't know, uh, but I think it's um, uh, to uh, um, their question about uh, uh, humanism. Um, Oh gosh, there's so much to say, but this does, I think, um, have a spiritual axis and uh, and does map very well onto process theology, if that's what you were reaching towards, um, um, uh, Michael. And uh, one of the people I work with and who I think deserves to be part of this conversation is Ilya Delio, um, who's a process theologist and very smart about science. One of her books is called The Not Yet God. And so the idea that what, what we're, what we're worshiping, uh, or at least what we're striving for is something that we need to help bring into existence, which if that's process theology, as I understand it, then is very, very much in line of what we're doing. And in some ways, what we're doing is, is, is searching for a form of humanism, which is uh, more spiritually powerful than I think humanism as it has often developed. But there's a large conversation there. I'm going to stop now. Michael, did I cover these things? Is there anything else you that I yeah, missed? Except the nature question. It's like, what are the, the key building blocks? Like, if we have simplicity, and every economics book starts with the two key assumptions of we're maximizing uh, utility maximizers, and there are no limits to our wants and needs, et cetera, uh, that's, that's the 
the basic thing that I think every student is exposed to, whether directly or indirectly, and it's been a cultural meme. So what is the alternative? I know pro-social, we're pro-social, but what else? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I would, I would uh, uh, give a call out to Kate Rayworth and her donut economics um, as somebody who did a very successful job of an alternative to neoclassical economics in a way that's just brilliantly um, um, rendered with her donut and, and so on. I think what's needed is a generalization of that, but uh, I think that uh, basically you're you're asking. I think what would an what would an economics textbook look like? Well, possibly, but I think I, that I, I, should... Michael. Sorry, I want to get to some other questions if we can. So. Okay, to be continued. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there are some alternative economics thinking. There is some economic alternative economics thinking coming out. Um, Chip, you've had both your hand up and um, a number of questions in chat. So let me turn to you. Sorry, Jim. I'll, I'll see if we can get back to you. So um, the question I put in the chat has evolved after you spoke. Um, Sandra, I, I, I'm writing something that David and I and others will work on in the peace building and related space. And I got up to work on that at three o'clock and realized I should actually read your book too. So I started the book on, on the shamanic uh, intellectuals. And what I realized is that you describe yourself just now as an outsider, an outlier. But in fact, all you, and I think all the people you describe, the only one I've actually physically had any personal contact with is Bob Quinn. Um, you're all actually quite successful inside the system as slightly weird in a constructive way people. And so isn't perhaps our challenge, I know it's true in my world, and I suspect it's true in David's, but isn't part of our job to surface um, the bright spots, the positive deviance, the people who are making a difference, and then build off of them in a strategy that feels more, uh, for lack of a better term, inside out than outside in as a 60s lefty. That's not the way I'm trained. Um, and you know, I, I see you smiling, but I don't know how to get there. And I certainly don't know how to get there in your world. So Sandra, I, why don't you begin? Is that a question for me? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole point and, of the whole point of catalyzing is to find like-minded people and come together. So I, I look, for instance, at what Michael has done here and bringing all of us together. And we're all going to go out and do our own thing. But we come away with a different understanding because we've listened to David, for instance. Or um, or what, again, Michael was behind the initial impetus for this. But I look at the, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, we all. And what they're trying to do in creating that new economics that we were just talking about and really framing it in economics in a different way and doing that through governmental intervention, citizens activism, um, narrative development and a whole series of other and, and, and city developments, including some that are working with Kate Rayworth and her her lab. So, I mean, it's that kind of connection of these ideas across these domains that I think is is what we need to be doing. Not that we stop the bottom up that we were talking about earlier, but that we, um, but we connect these into some sort of new coherence. No, uh, well, let me make three uh, quick, quick uh, comments. Point one: for any type of groups, you'll find a bell-shaped curve in terms of how well they're performing, and that the top end of that curve is the high-performing curve. That's your positive deviance. It's sometimes. Um, put it and we need to find them we need to study the whole curve basically the whole curve is interesting um including the high performers so that's a, an important thing to to do uh second the, what you were describing sandra and what's going on at this moment is a form of cultural catalysis catalysis chemical catalysis is the catalytic molecule grabs on other molecules pulls them in a way that binds them to each other and it's released to repeat the process so we're bringing people together, we're binding them together, and so on and so forth. So this is a form of catalysis. But my third point is that that's not good enough um, because at the end of the day, structure is needed. This is the part of the external uh, part. When we actually want to do get together and do things, then we have to have some kind of scaffold or framework for being intentional about cultural 
um, evolution. We need to be more regularly when we be begin to actually do something, then structure comes into to uh, play. And I often think that there's a bit of a disproportionate effort um, on inspiring people and the initial um, connections, of course, that's most thrilling. Um, and then there's the hard work of actually uh, niche construction or, or uh, constructing institution building and, and, and so on, but it's needed. And so structure at the end of the day, if it's not resulting in appropriate structure, think of it, I mean, the, the concept of, of, um, of, of, a, of, a, of a organization as an organism, Thich Nhat Hanh said about his monastery in Plum Village, this is not an organization, this is an organism. And I think that me metaphor isn't a metaphor. We really do want our groups to be like organisms, but for that to happen, they need to have everything we, we know about organisms, an anatomy, a physiology, an immune system, a nervous system, that's structure. And that's what we need to, to, um, uh, to yeah. work towards and to learn how to, to do with joy. Exactly. Thank you, David. Um, so A, A Callaway, Callaway, um, and um, possibly this will be the last question. Are you still here? I see your name. No? A Callaway? Okay, so um, Mark Kronig, you had a question? Mark, still here? I don't see. Oh, Mark. No? He's still here, but he's not. Yeah, Jim react. Stoner. Jim, I know. And Jim is leading an amazing initiative that is doing exactly what David just said. So maybe, Jim, you want to ask your question and talk about that? Thank you. Um, I, I put a note in the message box. When Marty showed the book, I... Um, laughed because I'd used that in class, I think the year it came out, my management course. And it, I think it lies under a lot of that initiative, which is to get this year 100 business schools to transform what they're teaching, very much in alignment with these really, really valuable sessions that Erica and Sandra and Michael and Ariane have been putting on and David. Absolutely. That um, Absolutely. And the goal is to transform in six months for free what they're teaching away from the neoliberal narrative and away from maximizing shareholder wealth to what you're talking about. And uh, everybody marries matters and stuff like everybody marries. Got to be careful about that. Everybody <laughs> matters. Fits very well with what we're doing. And so I really raise my hand to say thank you. I think it's, you're doing such a terrific job. Well, so, we all are, and so ask, I think. So go ahead. Sorry. Well, first of all, let's just congratulations all around because I think that um, that um, uh, this amazing work has been done and in progress. So, so um, just uh, you know more of that and um, and uh, more of uh, of speaking that uh, that common language. But uh, yeah. So, can, David, can I ask one more question? Uh, uh, a. Colway's question is, considering climate change and the need for sustainable transformation, how would GD explain the widespread denial in business and society of the need to adapt and steer and govern this change? And then we'll end there. Yeah, we'll end with a small question like that one. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much to say. I mean, one thing to say I've already said that we're, our beliefs are full of adaptive fictions. And so when we talk about climate denial or this and that, we have to all learn this. How does this alter uh, behavior? What does this do to social identity and so on? We have to be like always when we're faced with, with um, um, departures from the actual reality, we have to ask, what is this? How is this manifesting as behavior? And there, I think, although it's very complicated, we can see why why uh, fake news and climate denial and all of that is. Uh... Another thing is, is that people are most shaped by consequences at a local scale. I mean, they're basically, they're adapting uh, uh, or attempting to adapt uh, very well, thank you, but for goals that are very small compared to the global. So, I mean, uh, acting for the global good is the most difficult at all. Absolutely. It's the largest spatial scale, it's the largest temporal scale. It's not natural. 
it is uh, we were much more naturally inclined to adopt the local. Um, David, we're losing your voice here. Okay. Well, anyhow, I think that that's, that's good enough for our for our finishing up. Thank you. And I would just say that if you look around today, as opposed to even five or 10 years ago, you will see many initiatives that are trying to come together in new ways and bring bring a whole bunches of different actors together around landscape management, around water stewardship, around uh, fish fisheries, around economies. And, um, you know, so I think this catalytic process is happening and beginning to happen. And, and, and I just have to say thank you to David for sharing his perspective on, on this whole cultural evolution ph phenomenon with us and also for the books and uh, other articles that he's written that help help us to really grapple with that in a big way. And thank you all for attending. And um, uh, and we will see you in hopefully in December when Sandrine um, DeClev Dixon, Dixon DeClev will be coming. She's the uh, head of the Club of Rome and she'll be the next uh, intellectual shaman speaker. So thank you everyone. And thank you very much, David. Thank uh, you, Sandra. Thanks and, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you.